Hello, and welcome to Voices in Leadership During Crises. I'm Sarah Bleich, Professor of Public Health Policy at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, the Carol K. Forsyne Professor at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, and a member of the faculty at the Harvard Kennedy School. Voices in Leadership focuses on effective leadership to create positive change in public health. During the coronavirus outbreak, our regular series has been modified in two important ways. The first is that we're being broadcast using Zoom. And the second is that we'll be creating a very special focus on what it takes to lead in crises, especially during this global pandemic. Today, we welcome Governor Deval Patrick. Deval Patrick served as a two-term governor of Massachusetts from 2007 to 2015. In that time, he expanded affordable health care to more than 98% of the state, launched an initiative stimulating clean energy and biotechnology, steered, steered the state to a 25-year high in employment, and made unprecedented investments in Massachusetts public schools, among many other accomplishments. The governor was a candidate for the Democratic nomination for president of the United States. This past spring, he founded the Together Fund, a political action committee to support Democrats running in the upcoming election. Governor Patrick, welcome to the program. Thank you, Professor. Good to be with you. I wish I had so many titles as you. <laughs> it's great to have you. So where I want to start, Governor Patrick, is obviously with COVID-19, the racial inequities have really been underlined by this epidemic. So we know, for example, that Black Americans are hospitalized five times the rate as white Americans. There are much higher rates of death among Black Americans and white Americans. And you've spent much of your career thinking about civil rights, thinking about disparities. How should we try to understand the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on Black and Brown populations? Well, Sarah, I think the I think it's an important uh, question. I think we should start by understanding that those facts are real and that they come from the lived experiences of Black and Brown people as a as a group, rather than some sort of genetic predisposition. And I say that only because I've read and I have heard in conversation questions asked about whether Black people are just more susceptible uh, to uh, COVID nineteen. In fact. It's the, uh, it's the lack of access to um, nutritious food, to uh, regular, reliable uh, health care, to um, safe and secure housing, uh, the amount of stress, again, speaking uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of a whole group, um, that have exposed um, Black people and Hispanics to um, more vulnerability in general and more susceptibility to, uh, uh, to this virus. So, um, you know, like so many things, education is another area where I think, you know, the underlying issue is poverty uh, and the stress that comes from exclusion, um, systematic and structural. And we're talking a lot more about, uh, about both of those uh, these days. And I'm looking forward to uh, uh, the November elections so that we have a chance to start to do something in, at scale about both of those. And on that exact point of sort of talking more about systemic racism and structural inequality, mm -hmm. these are hard conversations. And you could argue that the country is having a bit of a social awakening right now. And that creates opportunity, but it also creates this tension around many black and brown people feeling like white people are just starting to come around to these ideas that have been struggles for others for a really long time. And so how do we reconcile that tension with really trying to make forward progress while we have a window of opportunity? Well. It's a tough, it's a tough situation um, because a lot of us um, uh, have felt, uh, you know, that that business of trying to of having to put other people at ease before white people in particular at ease before you can have any conversation about uh, race as if you you know I would I would get all these calls right at, I shouldn't laugh but um, all these calls uh, from friends of mine who are white many of them business uh, leaders checking on me as they said. Um, after uh, the George Floyd uh, videotape was released and, uh, and the activity on the ground, the marches um, really started to take hold. And uh, as I said, many of them were checking on, on, I mean, they all said they were checking on me, but some of them really just checking on, on themselves. They wanted to be reassured that they weren't um, the problem. And I think that the, um, we're at a point now where we have to kind of jump past the business of trying to put each other at ease and actually have the conversation. It isn't that you have to, that the only kind of uh, racist weight and limitation that black and brown people experience is when someone calls you a name 
or slams uh, the uh, actual or, or uh, metaphorical door in your face. There are things we accept. Um, you know, we talked about uh, um, racial uh, and ethnic disparities in healthcare. We accept those as a, we understand them better than we ever have, but we accept those. We accept uh, chronic poverty uh, among uh, uh, black and brown people overwhelmingly. We accept, um, or in many places have accepted, achievement gaps in, in schools. And all of these things, um, uh, yes, respond uh, to grit and determination and uh, you know the, what you bring personally, but they also respond and must respond uh, to d changes in our public um, in our public policy and our private behavior as well. So there's a certain amount of sort of taking a chance that we're going to have to do right now to get at these root causes, and that means I think on the on the part of uh, a lot of people, um, you know, putting your defenses down, opening your heart, and listening. And the root causes, which you allude to, obviously didn't start yesterday. They've been around for decades, if not centuries. And so I think that we're sort of naive to think that we can fix all this overnight, even though we have this window of opportunity right now. And so from your perspective, given that we have these sort of entrenched systems, what can we look to for short-term opportunities to make change? And then where do we have to take a sort of longer view as we think about ways to, to change the nation? Well, there are a couple of things I want to say about this. Um, uh, before getting to specific um, policies, you know, we we are we are at this um, what feels like unique moment um, of uh, of racial reckoning, um, in part because of the atrocities um, that we've been exposed to on videotape uh, recently, um, in part because we don't have access to the distractions that uh, normally play on our famously short attention span uh, as Americans in this, uh, in this country. But I think also in part because there is a certain confluence in the experience of black people with uh, you know, economic unease um, and uncertainty, with social isolation, with despair, uh, as measured by uh, uh, opioid addiction rates, for example. Um, uh, and, and by the way, these issues become issues at election time and then disappear in between uh, elections. That, those experiences are experiences of black people for generations. They're experiences of everybody now. I mean, one of the things that was used to just, I mean, when I listened to, before uh, the pandemic shut the economy down, I listened to the president's rosy uh, account of economic indicators, you know, unemployment was low as long as you counted both or all three of the low wage jobs a lot of people have just to survive, right? To, uh, um, um, inflation, uh, we're told is low, but, you know, ask somebody who's paying rent or a healthcare premium or, uh, or tuition, whether they feel like inflation is, uh, is low. In other words, we have large um, numbers in America um, who are feeling economically stuck and have for a very long time because, by the way, of choices we have made in public policy over the last several decades, actually. And so that's the first observation I want to make, that there is a confluence of the interests of Black and Brown people that go back generations with the experience of many, many people from, uh, uh, from around uh, uh, the country from many, many different backgrounds uh, today. The other thing I want to point out is that um, the um, uh, the um, the solutions, um, you know, many of them are on the table in terms of universal health care. You know, people mean a bazillion different things by Medicare for all, uh, but the idea, whether it's that or to give a uh, public option. Uh, uh, in uh, in Obamacare, so that there is an affordable um, portable. Um, uh, uh, healthcare uh, coverage for everyone, I think will then prompt us to deal with the issues of actual capacity to meet uh, everybody's, uh, everybody's needs. I think um, uh, uh, there are issues around uh, investing in housing and its affordability that we're going to have to, uh, that we're going to, have to face. And I think as we think about some of these and other uh, issues, 
we're going to have to raise our appetite uh, in public policy for innovation. We're going to have to try things. And one of the things about innovation is that you have to also raise your tolerance for failure. Um, politics punishes failure. Uh, and so I think we're going to have to get to a place where we are permitting at the public policy level, just as we do in the private sector, um, a, a willingness to try new things to get at root causes and try multiple things simultaneously and measure our, our performance without uh, you know, wagging a finger at, uh, at our political uh, leaders if it doesn't go 100% as planned. Mm -hmm. So if you'll permit me, Governor, I wanna get a little bit personal and have you talked to us a little bit about your own personal experiences with racism and how those have informed some of the perspectives that you shared with us today and that generally you've shared recently as you've been interviewed by a lot of other outlets. Oh, gracious. You know, um, they range, my own experiences range from, you know, defending three of the, of the folks who helped to organize the Selma to Montgomery March when they were indicted on vote fraud charges in the, in the Reagan administration, which we did successfully. In the courthouse, the federal courthouse in Selma that overlooks the Edmund Pettus Bridge to, um, you know, taking a, uh, a burger run as we used to call them when I was a student at, uh, at Milton Academy. Um, up to the McDonald's just over the line in, in Dorchester in the 19, early 1970s when I first came to Boston. Uh, and when the, you know, the, the lower class or the meaning the junior class kids were sent with the orders for the whole dorm and being greeted by a, a pretty nasty and angry mob that called me everything but a child of God and flicked cigarette butts into my Afro and, uh, and, the, and the rest and riding home with the with the uh, uh, you know dorm parent, um, lovely, nice young man, uh, white man, and having to comfort him because he was so undone, to the you know the indignities du jour as my wife describes, you know, including when I was governor, uh, and pulled over in uh, in the black SUV we were we were driving at me in the in the uh, passenger seat in a in a black plain plainclothes uh, police officer, uh, state trooper in the driver's seat. Um, at the other end of the spectrum though, I would say to you, Sarah, I have also had the experience of um, love, um, deep and intimate and important friendships across differences, racial and otherwise. And that's an experience that not a lot of people have. You know, we are, we live far less integrated lives um, than, uh, than many are willing to acknowledge. Uh, I think that's been one of the issues, uh, one of the sticking points, if you will, in American society for some time. And I mention that only because having taken that chance in crossing those lines and having seen other people take that chance in crossing those lines to me, means I have, um, I, I have, change the way I think about my defenses in, uh, in dealing with and working with um, uh, people who are different than, uh, than me. And I think there's a certain amount of practice at that that we're going to uh, we're gonna have to get to as a uh, uh, society. I won't prolong this answer uh, anymore, but except to say that, you know, when we have, you know, we've made a sort of an uneasy piece in this country around anti-discrimination laws, um, we have not made our peace with actual integration. Mm -hmm. um, and I can think of a number of ways from, you know, challenges to affirmative action in employment or in contracting or in uh, school admissions uh, to, uh, you know, the anti-bus, uh, 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 anti-busing uh, initiatives and so forth, where when it came to actually causing us to be together um, and have that experience, there's been incredible resistance. And then you take that down to the personal level and uh, you know whom you have at your dinner table, um, who you choose to live next to or not, uh, or whom you don't choose to live uh, uh, next to, those kinds of uh, experiences that, that, uh, that give us the practice of understanding how much we have in common and how much we don't and how much we understand each other and how much we don't. 
we're going to have to make our peace with those if we're going to find um, uh, reconciliation. And some of that understanding is challenged by the fact that we simply can't be near each other right now as much as we're used to. Well, that's right. That's right. I would say that the on the upside, um, as I said earlier, we have we have fewer distractions um, than uh, we normally do, and some of that time for reflection is probably in uh, uh, in our collective best interest. Yeah. So right now we're seeing in a lot of different areas that very focused advocacy can drive public opinion. We're sort of seeing that around a lot of the protests against police brutality. We're seeing that in some of the policies that are driving changes around COVID-19. And so it creates a lot of opportunity. It creates an opportunity for us in public health. And when we first started talking, you mentioned the need to be bold. And so what, what do you say to us in public health about how to maximize this opportunity to be bold and try to drive changes that really make a difference? So I, first of all, I think one lesson uh, we're reminded of uh, right now is that advocacy works. I mean, every uh, or many uh, state legislatures, um, uh, city council are taking up real reforms in how to think about policing um, and that come from very specific ideas. There's been a bill passed, I believe, in the House. I think the, um, the Senate has a bill as well, and they're trying to work those out uh, uh, at the federal level. And that is all good um, and important. But it's a demonstration that if you, if you make your, if people raise their voices and they get engaged, we can still make change. I'm hoping that that energy translates into votes in November. And I say that as a Democrat who doesn't think you have to hate Republicans to be a good Democrat, but I think we need uh, um, radically different um, leadership right now at the political uh, level. And my, uh, my uh, encouragement to many of the marchers and organizers and, and others who are looking for um, bold change is that you're, the energy that's being shown on the streets that is part of so many kinds of conversations like, uh, like this one is sustained after the election to push the folks who have been uh, elected to actually, um, actually deliver. And then the last point I would make goes back to the, uh, you know, our, our, uh, our tolerance for innovation. You know, we should try a bunch of different things in parallel. We don't have to do everything uh, nationally, not, necess not necessarily, and I'm not picking on any one, I'm not singling out any one uh, particular uh, avenue. We could try more than one way to, uh, uh, to accomplish uh, the goals we want. I'll just, I'll take, um, Oh gracious! I mean, take uh, uh, the movement to a um, to a green economy. You know, we accomplished the goals of the Paris Accords in Massachusetts seven or eight years ago. We've already surm uh, surmounted those uh, um, those uh, those standards. And so, how do we think again about um, uh, raising the expectations globally? but allowing for more than one way to accomplish those uh, expectations. I mean, we've proven that you don't have to trade a strong economy and a, uh, uh, and a, uh, and a carbon-free um, uh, future. Uh, but there are lots and lots of pieces to that. And we have not, for example, thought about how we bring people who are now a part of the carbon economy into that new economy, how we transition. We're pretty good nationally and historically at innovation. We're not as good at transition, and we should be thinking about that instead of thinking about the consequences afterwards, if at all. I know, Governor Patrick, that you're a big fan of John Lewis, and as we think about being bold and trying to drive change, are there certain things that we can take away from his legacy that you think might help inform our efforts now? You know, one of the things that uh, I've been listening to um, a lot on the radio are um, the uh, our excerpts of his speeches. Mm -hmm. And one that he gave um, in his early 20s was at the March on Washington in, uh, in 1963, I guess that was. <clears throat> and he talked about, the, about uh, uh, not being asked to be patient. I imagine that at the time, an awful lot of people said to him what an awful lot of people say to young people today about uh, the importance of patience. Um, 
but I think that his point was as true then as it is uh, now. We ought to be in a hurry. You know, from the perspective of, um, of a former um, policymaker, I have never understood, Sarah, how it is how it is people run for office without being willing to do it, meaning they, they want to they want to sort of accumulate their uh, political capital, but they don't want to spend any. Um, but you have to spend it if you actually want to get something, get something done. And I think that is the expectation we should have uh, as, uh, as citizens of our elected officials. I think the same is true, by the way, uh, of the private sector. Uh, we don't have the same influence in every case in changing out the leadership of our uh, of our companies, but we should raise our expectations as consumers of how companies behave, uh, meaning uh, less focus on short-term gain and more on long-term value. And when you start thinking about long-term value, you have to think about the interests of workers and the community and the environment. You have to. Uh, and the data, um, which has now been analyzed every kind of way, show that those companies that do are more valuable. Um, and our better financial investments as well as uh, other kinds. So we have, to, we have to start bringing into, I think, uh, all of our uh, expectations, this notion of generational responsibility, that we are in our time supposed to do what we can to leave things better for those who, uh, who come behind us. And I think that was very much what John Lewis was about, what his whole life exemplified. So we've talked about how we're in a social movement right now, and there's obviously lots of opportunity. What do you think are going to be the implications of what's currently happening for the election in November, for voting, for turnout, for example? Well, it's hard to say. I can tell you I hope that it means uh, th that turnout will be uh, uh, at historic highs. Uh, I hope that people, um, you know, as I said, I'm a Democrat. I'm hoping people will come out and vote for Democrats, but I hope folks will come out and vote for somebody. Um, because in a democracy, you're supposed to get the government you deserve, right? So we might as well, if we want better, we got to go out and invest the time. At the same time, I'm very clear, and folks should be, um, that at the national uh, level, the Republican Party has been working hard on voter suppression for a long time. It is a strategy. Uh, it's not uh, circum uh, uh, circumstantial. It is a strategy. And so I encourage people um, to have a vote plan um, to start thinking now about whether you're going to vote in person or by mail. If you can vote by mail, find out what the requirements uh, are, what the deadlines are, what the documents are that you need, and get them uh, in and filled out um, well in advance of the, uh, of the deadline. If you are not registered, register now. If, you're th if you think you're registered, check because in many places, the purging uh, uh, activities of, secretary, of secretaries of state have removed registered voters simply because they didn't show up in the last round or two. Um, and then if you're gonna vote in, po in person, you know, um, have a plan. I'd say, you know, bring a folding chair, have a, bring some water, make sure you've got your mask and so on. Bring something to read or something to listen to in case those lines are long. Um, because we have got to have participation to get better outcomes. And then um, we got to hold, to repeat something I said earlier, we have to hold those we elect to account to actually deliver. And that uh, doesn't mean being careless. Uh, it doesn't mean being hasty, but it does mean bringing a sense of urgency to the work. And so speaking of individual actions that people can take, there are many people listening right now who are students of public health, who are early in their careers, and if they want to be a positive force for change in this world, what's your sort of general advice to them? Well, I would say, first of all, don't give up because the challenge is uh, enormous. You know, the one voice persuading two others, and those two persuading uh, two others each, and it, it multiplies. Um, it, you know, there's that lovely metaphor that uh, uh, Bobby Kennedy used in a speech in South Africa about... Uh, about tossing a pebble into a pond and the ripples of hope. Um, don't underestimate your power to contribute um, to better outcomes for the people you serve and the people who look to you as an example or take an example from you, whether you think they're looking to you as a leader or not. That's the first thing. The second thing I would say is organize. 
you know, find others who um, are willing uh, to work alongside you to raise uh, the voices and the issues that are important to, uh, to public health. I mean, you know, Sarah, and those who are watching uh, from the public health uh, community know how we have been systematically um, uh, uh, defunding, if you will, public health for a long time now, and it shows. And so when folks say, well, what should we have done? Be ready. Um, be ready with answers that aren't just about, well, we should do what we used to do because we have different challenges. We have different tools. Um, we have different understandings uh, uh, of, each, uh, of each other um, than we did, you know, 20, 30, uh, 40 years uh, ago. And so trying to, again, imagine what kinds of innovations in the field would make us healthier make us a better, um, uh, better prepared for the kinds of things that are coming our way, um, whether it's uh, um, uh, a coronavirus or climate change um, or, uh, or you, know, you name it, um, how we think about racism as a public health uh, issue, uh, how we think about gun violence as a public health uh, issue, and what are the public health dimensions of those um, uh, solutions so that um, policymakers do less uh, in silos than uh, 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 than they so often do. So I, I think some of it is just um, it's the obvious, right? It's first first of all, don't don't presume you don't have an impact here. We need your voices. We need your contributions, um, and uh, and then band with others so that you can amplify. Uh, the impact of those uh, of those contributions. Last question for you, Governor Patrick. For listeners to the program that are thinking that they want to try to tackle public health issues through public office, what sort of the the core questions that people should ask themselves before taking that step? Well, you know, when I when I meet uh, first time candidates or candidates, frankly, even running for uh, reelection, they almost always tell me. They always almost almost always start with how they're going to win. You know, I've got this much money and these people who are going to endorse me and this is my strategy and all that. And I always stop them and say, well, why? Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we jump to the how so fast. Um, we really need to examine the why. And the reason I think, it doesn't have to be the same answer for everyone, but the, but the reason to have an answer is that when the inbound comes, um, whether it's in the campaign or in office, the bazillion ways to be distracted from the agenda you thought you had, if you don't remember why and keep going to that, it's very hard uh, to separate, as they say, the wheat from the chaff. And so the first thing I, I would say is ask yourself why. And if the best why you can come up with is, is that you like to hear the sound of your own voice, do something else because that's not what we need right now, uh, in my view, in, uh, in public leadership. On that note, thank you, Governor Patrick, for your time and for your candor. It's been really nice to spend this half an hour with you. Thank and you. to our listeners, um, please stay tuned for more segments in Voices in Leadership During Crises. And in the meantime, we hope that you stay safe. Thank you, and you be well. <laughs>